Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, and welcome. It is great to be here in person for the annual AUSA Small Business Seminar and mass make, Matchmaking Seminar. Virtually is fine, but uh, I think it, you'd agree that it's great to see folks in all their glory here today. So thank, thank you for coming out. This is our 10th annual Small Business Seminar and matchmaking sessions that we'll have today and, and tomorrow. Uh, so definitely, I know some of you have been here before, and I, I thank you for continuing to support. Uh, hopefully that we'll be able to provide you the information you need to uh, do more business uh, with the Army and, and other federal ag agencies. I am James Lloyd. I'll be your MC for the day. Uh, throughout the day, we'll introduce our, uh, the other members of the team if you got questions to assist you. Uh, I think today we have a real uh, great agenda in store uh, for you. We'll start off this morning uh, with the Under Secretary of the Army, uh, Honorable uh, Gabe Camarillo, uh, followed up by the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology, Honorable, uh, <laughs> I lost his name, Bush. Will, will come and speak with us. We might, we might even have an opportunity for some Q&A with uh, uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Camarillo, if time, time permits. Then we'll be followed uh, by, we have a representative here from SBA, Mr. Larry Stubblefield, the Associate Administra Administrator for the Office of Veteran Business Development from uh, uh, SBA. We'll be here to talk a little bit about the transition between the Veteran Administration and, and SBA, followed by the um, Office of Small Business Directors for DOD uh, panel with the uh, OS DOD Small Business Director, Mr. Mr. Meter. This afternoon, we'll again have a panel on Veteran Small Business Program, and then we'll close it out with the uh, Associate Directors for Small Business at the Army uh, buying commands. Uh, I think these are the folks that we like to say where the rubber meets the road to help you understand who to market your goods and services to. With that said, I'll just, uh, just a couple of reminders. Um, as always, I ask that you silence or mute your uh, phones or PDAs. Uh, as not to disturb either the speakers or your, or your neighbors. Uh, restrooms, uh, some right down the hall here. Uh, if you go to this ain't church, you don't have to raise your hand to go. Just uh, do what you need to do. We have, as in the past, we have the flow mics. Please, please, if you have a question, make your way to the mic and uh, ask your question. Understand you to introduce yourself but we don't need your whole um, capability statement. Uh, uh, be, be mindful of, of, of your neighbors here in the room and, and uh, ask your questions um, from the, the, the panel or our, or our speakers. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Kimberly, Kimberly Bueller, who is currently serving as the Army Director of Small Business Program where she provides executive leadership for all aspects of the Army Small Business Mission, which includes a portfolio of over $24 billion of average annual contract awards to small business primes. In her role, Ms. Bueller provides advocacy and outreach, develops and disseminates policies and procedures, and conducts oversight of execution of a small business program. Ms. Bueller has over 22 years of services, service with the U.S. Army and a certified contract professional. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Ms. Kimberly Bueller, Director, Army Office of Small Business Program. All right, 
good morning everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me. If at some point you can't, just raise your hand, let me know. Um, I'd like to, uh, that got louder. <laughs> so thank you, uh, James, for, um, for those introductions and those really important um, reminders as we get started here this morning. Um, it's good to see everybody in person. Uh, last year's AUSA was a bit of a hybrid, so this year we're fully back um, in person. We're very excited to have the in-person matchmaking um, as well tomorrow. And as James said, we have a very packed agenda today. Um, it, our schedule this morning is a little bit in flux, so we ask you to bear with us. Um, the Undersecretary of the Army has actually asked us to do a Q&A with all of you. Uh, that wasn't originally on the agenda. So I want you to start thinking about, um, you know, what the message that, that sends, right, how important that is to have the Undersecretary of the Army not only come and speak with, to you about some exciting initiatives that we have planned, but also to give you the opportunity to engage directly with him. So hopefully you'll have um, good, easy questions for him. Um, you know, <laughs> um, if, I, I did want to mention, if you have a specific issue on a, a contract or something like that, um, you know, please come up to uh, myself or someone on the staff here. I'm going to introduce them in just a second. Um, you know, he obviously is not going to be able to solve your problem for you, um, but, you know, we certainly will do our best to help. Um, I do want to thank uh, the staff of the Small Business Programs Office uh, for their work in uh, helping with AUSA as well as everything else um, that they do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis to support the small business program. So can I have everybody from the OSBP staff stand up, please? All right, so now you know who they are and what they look like and what color they're wearing. So, <laughs> but please be respectful if somebody's running to the bathroom or to get a cup of coffee to allow them to do that. Uh, we, I also see some other folks here in the office from the Assistant Secretary of the Army um, for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. Um, so, uh, Mr. Singleton, Ms. Boatner, um, thank you very much for, uh, for coming here today to, to hear the remarks. We've been working very closely together um, on some in initiatives that the Undersecretary is going to announce later. And we have, uh, we already have the Air Force and DLA in the house, um, as well as the SBA. So everybody's very excited um, to be here and to engage with you today. So uh, thank you to Mr. Kaiser, Mr. Daniel, and Mr. Stubblefield from the SBA to, uh, for coming so early this morning. And I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us. Um, I know that you have choices, particularly at AUSA, in where you can be. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to join us. Okay. Um, I also wanted to recognize we have um, a, one of our CEOs from Gene Capture. Uh, the, the CEO from Gene Capture. That's one of our mentor protege agreements that we have. So Peggy Salmon, um, who's over there in a, a salmon colored jacket. Um, <laughs> so um, this is one of our uh, most successful mentor protege um, agreements that we have in place. Um, I did have to cut some content out of my presentation this morning, but we have information on the Mentor Protege program as well as Gene Capture um, that is uh, has been scrolling this morning, and we'll continue to scroll that um, information during our breaks and over the lunch period. So I I invite you to. Um, uh, to look at those, uh, they're not just fillers, they actually contain important information. And I did want to point out, Ms. Salmon, um, in case anybody has questions about the Mentor Protege program from a contractor perspective, um, she would be a, a great person to kind of pick her brain about uh, how that program has been. And we have uh, Ms. Gaina Malcolm Packnett, um, who is our Mentor Protege program manager, who will be doing matchmaking tomorrow as well. So I encourage you to learn more about that program. Okay, and I apparently have a clicker, so we'll see how this goes. Okay, I think it works. <laughs> okay, so the theme of this year's AUSA meeting is building the Army of 2030. To quote the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Army is in the middle of the most significant transformation in the past four decades as the service continues to advance initiatives to support personnel under the Army People Strategy, 
all while maintaining critical modernization priorities to bolster joint domain operations. And if you were here with us yesterday, you know exactly what the Army's doing um, in those domains. Whether it be the pacing threat of China, the reality of Russian aggression, or adapting to the um, perils of climate change, the Army is evolving to meet today's challenges. We're building upon our rich history of success and recognize the importance of today's Army to achieve overmatch and guarantee decisive victory across all domains. When the nation calls, the Army delivers. But we don't deliver alone. We must have a strong, resilient, and responsive industrial base. Companies to deliver warfighting capability through contracts. Small business innovation is the cog that closes the gap between the current solutions and the solutions that the Army needs to build the Army of 2030. For those of you who've seen me speak before, you might recognize this slide, but it is a little bit different. Um, it, usually I'm talking about how small business professionals are those individuals that are going to help connect you as small businesses into the Army, um, you know, closing that gap. But when we were sitting down and thinking about small businesses, I'm like, you know, this is really what small businesses do too. It's the small businesses that are going to help close that gap between the Army of today and where we need to be. And not just 2030, but 2040 and beyond. The Army's small business priorities align with both the national security priorities and the Army priorities. And they're also aligned to the federal equity priorities. In fact, equity has always been part of the small business programs. They recognize that small businesses face different challenges and barriers to entry than large businesses. And as the small business programs expanded to include different equity groups, such as women-owned small businesses and businesses in economically underserved areas, such as the Hub Zone program, the Army expanded its contract opportunities. Simply put, small business programs are in the Army DNA. We're well prepared to meet the challenge that was set out in Executive Order 13985, which was the first executive order issued under the Biden administration in January of 2020. And it put equity and procurement and the purchasing power of the federal government front and center. And then OMB followed up with a memorandum M-2203 to implement the mandates and the, the call to action in that executive order. I bring these up because it's really important for you as small businesses to be following these federal level initiatives and issuances. Because they are setting the pace for what we in DOD as well as across the federal government, it's setting our behavior. In fact, there's now been another OMB issuance, M-2301, which was issued on October the 4th, so right at the beginning of the new fiscal year, that set a 12% small disadvantaged business goal for FY 2023. And if you're following the original OMB memorandum as well as the executive order, you know that the call to action is to get to 15% by 2025. So we already have our 2023 uh, calling card, and we, are, we know that the Army is going to be well positioned uh, to meet that, um, that call to action. So the Secretary of the Army issued the first small business memorandum since 2009 in April of 2022, so just this past year. Um, and this was really to implement what was set forth in OMB's original memo um, 22-03. So I think that really shows the commitment of the Army at the highest levels of the Army to the small business programs and to advancing the equity initiatives. I do want to take a couple of minutes just to review the FY22 preliminary accomplishments. Um, as you are probably aware, uh, there's a lot of um, actions that need to settle from the end of the fiscal year. We don't get our official numbers until second quarter. 
Uh, so there's a lot of um, cleanup, for lack of a better word, that goes on. Um, so anything I'm going to show you is subject to change. But generally speaking, the numbers don't fluctuate um, to any degree where I would feel uncomfortable showing you our preliminary numbers. So as you can see, um, these are the numbers that were pulled October the 3rd. And you can see the Department of Army not only met but exceeded the expanded goal for small disadvantaged business that was set out in the executive order as well as um, the OMB memorandum. We did not exceed all of our goals, which is not typical of the Army. For eight years in a row, we met all of the small business goals, even all of the socioeconomic categories. And then something called COVID came along, and the Army started doing a lot of support to uh, the federal government, particularly for vaccine procurements. And what we've seen is that because those vaccine procurements go into our eligible small business spend, but aren't really eligible for small business awards, right, Pfizer's not a small business, um, that really does impact our overall goal percentages. Um, but I would encourage you not to focus on that because it's just part of the story. So what we'd like to do is adjust for the COVID support, which we'll be transitioning over to uh, the Department of um, uh, HHS, so um, Health and Human Services. As that spend moves um, over to HHS, we should see more normalization of the Army's small business achievements. Because I think as you can see, when we take COVID out, not only did we um, meet our goals, we far exceeded them across the board. I mean, 32% to small business of all Army Prime contracts is just extraordinary. And the fact that we exceeded the small disadvantaged business goal even with the COVID numbers is really extraordinary. So, you know, all of this is really the direct result of the hard work that's done at the field level from our small business professionals who are advocating for you on a daily basis. One caveat, the Army is also doing a lot of support um, for the, the fight in Ukraine. So we are getting replenishment funds, but we're keeping an eye on how that potentially could impact our small business achievements in FY23, because again, we're gonna see that uh, those dollars reflected in the, uh, in the denominator, but they're not really gonna go to small business in the numerator. So uh, you know, that might be a, a bit of a challenge, but again, we're the Army, we accept challenge, um, and we're, we're gonna beat it. So, uh, we are well positioned. Okay, so as I start to um, wrap up, I want to announce some of our upcoming small business engagements. Um, I especially want to highlight um, our virtual vendor engagement. So we're going to maintain these um, bi-monthly um, teams, uh, live-based engagements with small business because we know that while it's great to come to AUSA and to go to those national industry association um, meetings and engagements, there is a cost for all of that. And there's a lot that we can do virtually to continue to uh, support and train small business and meet our um, training mission as well. So um, we're really trying to bring you relevant topics um, as you can see there, you know, we're hoping to have a panel on the Army's climate strategy, um, uh, which I'm sure that you, if, again, if you were here yesterday, you would have heard a lot about. Um, and then intellectual property, which um, is an area that we know a lot of small businesses um, need assistance with and, and struggle with. We're hoping to hear more about um, intellectual property in a little bit from the undersecretary. This is definitely um, something forefront in his mind. Um, made in America, there's a lot of energy around this right now, and there's uh, the Made in America office um, up at the White House, and uh, we would like to have them come uh, brief you on uh, what the changes are as well as how it impacts small business. And then finally, um, uh, foci and um, 
uh, trusted capital. So this is an area where, you know, how you manage foreign investment, right? How you, um, if you have foreign investors, what you need to do in order to, to set up firewalls and different protocols um, in order to do with that, to deal with that. And when you're, you know, what considerations should you have if you have interest from, uh, from foreign investors, right, as you're, you're looking to uh, make your business decisions. So, uh, you know, that's a very um, important topic. It actually, if you were here with us at AUSA a few years ago, I think it was 2019, uh, that was a very popular topic and we thought it would be important to, uh, to bring that back. Um, and particularly as we're, um, you know, trying to, again, address the challenges of our, um, uh, the, our pacing threat of China, um, foreign investment is, is very important to consider. If you would like to um, learn more about our upcoming engagements and stay you know, up to date on um, when they are, how to register, where we might be speaking, other um, federal events that might be going on, we do publish those up on our website, which is um, osbp.army.mil. Um, we've got nice QR codes now out in the hallway that you can scan, um, which will take you right to our website. Um, and then you just go to the um, events tab. Uh, at the, the top of the page, and that'll take you um, right to where you can register for these events or get more information. And I would highly encourage you to follow us um, at Army Small Biz on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, you can follow me personally, but I will tell you I am not a very good social media um, poster, so you would probably have much better luck following us um, at Army Small Biz. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to accept a request. Um, you know, timeliness, um, they're probably, it's probably more timely when it's not me, <laughs> but i um, happy, to, happy to try and help as I can. Um, let's see. And I see that the undersecretary is not here yet, so um, what I would like to do is if there's any questions for me, um, I can take them at this time. Um, and then we will, uh, when the undersecretary gets here, we'll transition um, over to him. Like I said, uh, at the end of um, his presentation, his remarks, um, he is going to engage in a Q&A. So uh, we have two um, microphones that are set up. Um, so we are asking that if you have any questions to please utilize them. James probably mentioned all this in the opening. I wasn't paying attention. So, um, But if you could please uh, line up at the mics, um, that would be the, the most efficient way to make sure that everybody has an opportunity. So um, OK, at this time, if anybody has any questions, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to take them. And if not, I'm going to have to do a song and dance, so which you really don't want to see. <laughs> yes, hi. Hi. I'll help you out. Oh. Okay. I'll try to help out. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, with regard to trusted capital, could you give the audience a little sense of where that initiative is? It seems like there was a lot of heat and noise around that space a couple of years ago, and there were some groups that seemed to be leading that effort. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I've lost a thread, or maybe they've gone dark, um, but I, I would love to know what the status of that is. I think that's a great question, and you're right. There was a lot of um, focus on that. Um, we will be having the, the DOD director's panel later, and we will have uh, uh, Mr. Mita, I um, learned um, early this morning, will actually not be able to join us, but there will be somebody from his office um, facilitating who should be able to provide a, um, a more full um, conversation of that, but it is something that we have talked about as DOD directors. So the initiative is alive and well. Um, it's just you know taking a little bit of a different form right now. So it, it's still an important topic for sure. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Chelsea Maggett from Collaborative Compositions. Hi. Um, I'm just curious if you have a grip on what the uh, increase in non-traditional spend was or non-VAR acquisitions. Yes, yes. So actually, we track that. Um, on, uh, you know, just like we track our traditional FAR-based contracts, 
we have noticed for the past two fiscal years that our spend, particularly on um, other transactions or OTAs, um, has come down, um, but the Army still remains the um, uh, largest purchaser <laughs> through those types of non far based agreements. Um, so that is something that we have, um, we would like to have a better fidelity on how much of that is actually going to small business, um, you know, as opposed to non-traditional, which is a little bit of a, you know, broad category. Um, and then when awards are made to consortiums, we don't always have that level of granularity if a small business actually gets the awards. Um, but yes, we, we do track the OTAs. Like I said, the Army's still the most um, widely uh, wide user of those. Um, we're also trying to get a better understanding of the government purchase card because a lot of purchases are made through um, to small business through that um, mechanism, which you know is up to ten thousand dollars now. So you know that as well is um, a good news story. Um, but it's oops, sorry about that. Um, but it is uh, it is a little bit more difficult because we don't have that great reporting process like we do um, with the FAR based. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Mike Winters, Mission Analytics, and we are a SDVOSB, and we're uh, AV integrator, so we survive uh, generally under Part 12, Part 13, you know, small business set-asides. And to make sure I understood the slide correctly, mm -hmm. it looked like the 2022 goal for SDVOSB was under, right? So the goal was 12.6%, I think, for small disadvantaged business in FY22, mm -hmm. and we achieved over 14%. Okay, but specifically to service-disabled veteran, that looked... Oh, I'm sorry. For, so for service-disabled veteran, yes. Um, we, we did not meet the goal okay. because of the COVID spend. When we take the COVID spend out, particularly the vaccine procurements, I Go mean, on. there was... $5 billion to Pfizer in October. So it was like, okay. what a way to start the fiscal year. Um, so we officially are not gonna make the, the service disabled veteran owned goal, but when we adjust for like our normal regular army spend, we, we are over it. Okay, that wasn't my question. I just wanted to clarify okay. that yes. before I jumped in. <laughs> so um, SDVOSB set asides are a rarity. Um, in the Department of Veterans Affairs, of course, they're the majority, but elsewhere. And uh, two years ago, I won one from the Marine Corps and they said, yeah, we got a briefing on it. We're like, hey, why don't we do this? I'm like, well, sure, why not, right? Uh, what I do find is that like on Unison or even on uh, SAM, the US Army, I have never seen an SDVOSB set aside. And I've you know, won multiple contracts and you know, compete for mm -hmm. literally hundreds. Um, and they just don't exist. Um, now, maybe they do in certain uh, market areas, but not in mine. Yet CBP, FBI, they seem to you know, be there. So the question is, if the goal's not met, how come, you know, the opportunity's there? And I, I do the uh, 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 respond to source of SOT, identify myself as an SDVOSB, comes out not an SDVOSB. Don't have a problem with that, but I'm just surprised that that's happening and the goal's not being met. Yeah, so I think that's a fair point, right? Um, and that is where we need to be using data to inform decision makings and help that inform acquisition strategies. I can't stress how important RFIs are into making those decisions. And you know, it's got to be there's got to be more than one vendor, right, who responds to the the RFIs and has done so in a, an appropriate manner that answers all the questions and you know shows how you can um, can do the full capability. Um, so we do, uh, you know, utilize the full range of set aside opportunities within the Army. Like you said, maybe not in your area, um, but that's where I think data can help us understand not only um, how we buy within the Army, but how the rest of the federal government or even within DOD is using those, um, those flexibilities and authorities. And I think it's a training issue. I mean, I, I think that definitely we need to constantly be on top of training our contracting workforce, particularly as uh, regulations and um, statutes change to make sure that they are um, aware of the latest and greatest. And the, the programs change over time. And um, you know, we even though we have requirements to take uh, 40 hours of, of training every year, that may not be in a specific area where there's been a change, right? So that's incumbent upon us as small business professionals to help um, make sure that 
the contracting workforce understands all the tools in the toolbox. But thank you for your, your Thanks, question. I appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if the undersecretary shows up, please come give me the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you Good for your morning. brief. My name is Mike Thompson, and uh, I'm a, the business development director for a service disabled veteran owned small business Tacoma. Just kind of a follow up on that last question. Why is such a, a great push on the small disadvantaged businesses, and we're going to increase that to 15%? And service disabled veteran owned small business didn't hit the goal. But I've, uh, in years past, there's uh, Hub Zone women-owned and service-disabled have always been in that 3% threshold. Are we going to increase um, service-disabled opportunities to 5% to match women-owned, where that has been historically? Um, or, because we haven't hit it this year and I think last couple years. I mean, so what's going to be, uh, you know, the, the emphasis to increase opportunities for service-disabled companies? So that, I'm glad you asked that because we actually have – um, that's been part of our programming for today, that we've, uh, we have a veterans panel um, later this morning. We have Mr. Stubblefield, who um, runs the uh, veterans program at the Small Business Administration. So we don't like the direction that our small uh, service-disabled veteran-owned um, dollars have been going. So we are taking action, and that um, including our, the programming that we chose to provide today. Um, and it, again, it's something that uh, James Lloyd is our um, service disabled veteran owned uh, program manager. And it's something that we've, you know, talked about, you know, how are we going to um, make sure that we are meeting all of our goals. Um, it, it has been hard with COVID. I mean, there's just, you know, when you're doing multiple $5 billion, um, you know, vaccine procurements, it's, it's hard to overcome that. Um, so when we adjust and we're like, okay, we are hitting our goal, but how can we do better? There has been some conversation at the federal level about what is the right time to increase all of the goals. Um, so, you know, please know that there are people um, very mindful about, um, about the goals and, you know, trying to make sure that we're pushing across and expanding opportunity across all of the um, all of the programs and not just focusing on one. So, and um, the um, Undersecretary of the Army is here. Um, so thank you very much for joining us here, sir. Um, I'm gonna do a quick introduction and then turn the floor over to you. So um, the Honorable Gabe Camarillo serves as the um, Undersecretary of the Army. He was confirmed by the US Senate on February the 2nd of 2022 and he is serving as the 35th um, Undersecretary of the Army. Um, as the Undersecretary of the Army, he is the Principal Civilian Assistant and Principal Advisor on matters related to the management and operation of the Army, and he's also the Chief Management Officer of the Army. His prior career um, highlights include significant experience in law, government, national security, and private industry. Mr. Camarillo previously served as the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. I always want to say Army there. <laughs> and uh, in that position, he was responsible for military and civilian personnel and reserve component matters for the Air Force. Um, prior to that, he served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, helping to lead and supervise Army modernization programs, procurement, logistics, and R&D investment. And uh, incidentally, we worked together on small business programs uh, when we were both over in the ASALT, so it's kind of come full circle. Uh, Mr. Camarillo's private sector experience includes legal practice at several law firms with emphasis in the areas of commercial litigation, campaign finance law, and government ethics. Mr. Camarillo also taught campaign finance law as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Recently, he served as senior vice president at SAIC, where he led two business units for engineering and IT services company. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Government at Georgetown University and a law degree from Stanford University. He has two children, Nathan and Natalie, in Virginia. Uh, without any further ado, Mr. Camarillo, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. 
And Kim, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I think I remember doing one of these many years ago. So same room, same AUSA, but it's glad, it's, I'm really excited to see everyone back in person again. I know it's been quite some time. So uh, Kim, I do wanna begin by thanking you and the Army Small uh, Business Team uh, for not only you know, setting this event up together and getting everybody in the same room, but also for all of your work to ensure that the Army meets its small business participation goals. I know it's been a tremendous effort with COVID and uh, congratulations to all of you. I'm gonna give you a big round of applause. So I wanna take a little bit of time today to talk about uh, some new initiatives, but I wanna first begin by mentioning that the Army's commitment to working with small businesses in general, it shows up in, in many ways. Uh, first and foremost, I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, a history of setting the trend across the Department of Defense in terms of meeting our government-wide goals uh, for small business participation. But also, I'd like to say that our small business team uh, has a history of also putting together the most innovative approaches to ensuring that we maintain that high level of participation and trying to find new approaches to attract small businesses to work with the Army. So just in this last year alone, despite spending $28 billion in FY22 to fight the COVID pandemic, we still reached in, an, in the Army 95% of our overall small business participation goals. And so we are in many ways the model for other federal agencies how the Army does is largely how the Department of Defense does every single year. But it, today's speech is not just about benchmarks. As I know very well from my time in both the Pentagon, two tours, and in the industrial base, small businesses are absolutely key and vital to the Army's modernization goals and to our ability to meet the national defense strategy. This year's AUSA theme is building the Army of 2030 which requires all of us to equip our warfighters with cutting edge technologies that will give soldiers the decisive edge in battlefields, not only in 2030, but also beyond. This is how we will build our enduring advantage central to the national defense strategy. In many ways by outthinking, outworking, and outproducing our competitors in the areas that will define warfare for decades to come. Now, we cannot meet these goals without contributions from America's small business innovation base. Small businesses, in many ways, are the sources of the innovation that fill the knowledge and capability gaps, help us maintain readiness, and they enable modernization in the future. But as we all know, small businesses often struggle as, as they face barriers when trying to do business with the Army. The acquisition process is daunting, and it can become a complex maze for even the most experienced of vendors. The reality is that many of our processes are optimized for large-scale integrated weapon systems. Not as much is it optimized for software vendors, systems engineering firms, or small innovative suppliers. The choice that small innovative companies face is to either compete for a very small slice of directly awarded contracts or grants, or develop partnerships with large prime vendors. But this path can also be challenging, and success depends in many ways on key supplier relationships uh, and frankly, awareness of what innovative solutions our small businesses bring to the table. Similarly, our integrators, which are those larger primes, they're key to this ecosystem synthesizing the contributions of a diverse ecosystem of manufacturers, suppliers, and service providers to deliver capability into soldiers' hands. Innovative small businesses help integrators with cutting edge solutions as they build and produce the larger weapon systems that our warfighters rely on. So there's a natural, critical partnership that exists here. And if we're gonna improve our efforts to transition technology for the warfighter, we must do more to ensure that integrators and small businesses can work together. So today, I'd like to share five initiatives that the Army will be launching to help small businesses in FY23 and beyond better collaborate with our integrators so that we get our soldiers the most innovative and decisive capabilities that we can. These programs will encourage partnerships, they will drive accelerated adoption of critical technologies, 
cultivated through Army and DOD-wide investments. The first is the Army's Catalyst Program, through which we will establish a pilot program in which the Secretary of the Army will reserve a portion of our Small Business Innovation, Innovative Research Grant Program funding to invest in those critical technology areas that are essential to capabilities needed to modernize the Army. Potential focus areas as we launch this first project will include, for example, uh, everything ranging from smart sensors to improve decision uh, sensitivity and detection sensitivity while maintaining a low signature. It could include climate adaptive technologies that make soldiers resilient in the, in the field, AI and machine learning capabilities for contested environments. Directing these investments at the Secretary's level will prioritize innovation in critical areas while hopefully catalyzing private venture capital and integrator investment as well. The companies that we invest in should have a higher chance of participating in those integrators programs and transitioning through that pathway. Though we also want to make sure that we utilize this investment to take risks and make sure that we uh, innovate where we can. This pilot catalyst program will begin in the second quarter of FY23, enabling prototype awards 10 times larger than our typical SIBR grants at around 15 to 25 million each. Second, there is a, a new effort that we're starting called Project VISTA, which stands for Valuing Innovation with a Source Selection Technical Advantage. This project will enable our integrators to receive a higher technical rating during source selection if they draw on small businesses' innovative technologies. The idea here is to encourage integrators to bring in small businesses, help them transition, and realize a return on Army investments in research, prototyping, and testing. We are currently working on identifying pilot programs for Project VISTA based on the maturity and criticality of the designs, the technology, and the requirements and we hope to select one or more candidates in the coming months to try this effort. So this is us trying to find a way to build those pathways to transition technologies that are outside the direct grant and direct contract award process. Third, the Army is going to build an intellectual property cell of expertise at Army headquarters to provide advice, assistance, and resources to small businesses and the acquisition workforce on intellectual property matters. Small businesses, as we all know in this room, often hesitate to participate in Army acquisition programs for fear of losing too much of their intellectual property. The cell of experts that we are building in this initiative will work directly with small businesses, the Army's R&D community, and program offices within the Army to develop balanced approaches to intellectual properties that incentivize small business participation while safeguarding and addressing Army sustainment needs, helping the Army to balance those critical uh, needs and demands a little bit more effectively. This cell will also broadly help our acquisition workforce to ask for the right amount of intellectual property instead of the typical all or nothing approach that we've seen in the past. As you all know, the Army has traditionally uh, cast its lot in this direction. We uh, have adopted a policy to take a more nuanced approach to intellectual property, but we know that one of the areas where we are lacking is expertise in-house to make it happen and to tailor those approaches specific to individual programs. This cell of experts will definitely help us do that, and it will help us or enable us to take a positive step in this direction. Fourth. The Army will relaunch an R&D marketplace that will connect small businesses and other technology developers with in integrators and other larger primes, along with RDT&E funding sources and resourcing opportunities. The marketplace, I'm sorry, the marketplace will break the model of traditional stovepipe databases, and it will serve as a unique tool in the federal government by providing unprecedented transparency and connectivity across a wide range of stakeholders. Army and DOD contracting officers, small businesses that develop technology, and integrators will be able to see Army investments, vet technology maturity, and assess program milestones to make informed decisions about how to navigate our processes. 
AI and data fusion tools will ensure that programs and integrators can find and employ the right small business technology at the right time for the right programs. The marketplace we hope to open later this fiscal year. And finally, we are adding a prime competition to our XTech Awards, the Army's flagship prize competition. Currently, our innovative small businesses compete at XTech to showcase their technologies and get the attention and the resources that they need in order to transition into Army contracting opportunities. Since 2018, we've held 20 competitions that have led to over $15 million in cash prizes and $72 million in follow-on R&D contracts. Now what we hope to do is flip the script by requiring an Army integrator and one or two non-traditional small businesses team up and compete for the award. The competition will drive down transition risk by incentivizing collaboration and prototyping upfront. Winners will be eligible for a follow-on contract for prototype development and deployment, and the competition kicks off in FY23. We plan on announcing the winner of the first round of awards at next year's AUSA. So these are our five signature initiatives for small businesses. And in my view, I think they will change the game for our innovative, uh, innovative small business in, uh, industrial base and hopefully create more pathways and more opportunities to work with the Army. We're providing small businesses with new avenues to work with our integrators and to get their foot in the door. This is a crucial investment that will ultimately help our soldiers to develop a decisive advantage over future adversaries. So I'm happy now to take any questions you have in just a minute. But I want to close before I do by giving an example of why these efforts are so critically important. Under our mentor protege program, which has been around for many years, we're trying now to supercharge some of the efforts that I just described. There's a small business called Gene Capture that worked under the guidance of tech masters to develop a cost, cost effective rapid pathogen detection technology. They've built a highly portable miniaturized device to support warfighters in remote locations. They've evolved their technology further in response to the COVID pandemic. Gene Capture has been awarded multiple prime contracts, including Sibbers, to help them get through the prototype development phase and mature their technology. And they're currently requesting FDA approval for their device. This is just one of many examples of success that happens every single day. And we cannot continue to meet the needs that we have to our warfighters without the contributions of our small businesses. So I really want to thank you all for making some time for me this morning and open up the opportunity for some questions. Good morning, Chelsea Maggett from Collaborative Compositions. Between the Cyber, XTech, OTs, and now the Catalyst, uh, do you have a transition rate or a fielding rate for any of these technologies over the past two to three years? And uh, are we seeing them being spread in terms of funding? Uh, how's the R&D funding being spread? Yeah, I wish I had some metrics that I could uh, recite, uh, but I don't, and we can certainly provide that. Uh, what I will tell you is that we have made over the last three or four years in the Army a more determined effort to bring in and attract those non-traditionals. What the metrics do show that is in the last three years, the Army by far across the Department of Defense has been the largest user of OTA agreements specifically. I think even accounting for COVID, I think we are dwarfing what the other services are doing. That is a positive step in the right direction, but I think that we can do more and we'll continue to gather data on those efforts. Morning, sir. Good to see you again. Good to Met see you at too. the AF Summit event. Uh, Jack Skandasamy, CEO of Leighton AI. Couple of questions. One is, how do we participate in the project Vista early stages? Um, we be a great candidate in that. Uh, second question is, I've been walking around the halls of the, the convention center and I see a lot of um, army folks walking up to traditional companies asking about job openings and stuff. With the Mentor Protege program, why not extend that to transition some of those folks to work with folks like us in small business so we get to uh, um, experience some of their, uh, their experiences and help us integrate better with uh, uh, supplying for the Army? So two great questions. So on the first one, with regard to Project Vista, 
Uh, again, we're doing something a little bit novel here. We're looking at our source selection evaluation criteria to find ways to provide extra credit, if you will, or incentives for integrators to work with uh, you know, designated uh, small businesses and also in those critical technology areas that we think are gonna be so important for the Army. How we do that is gonna be a process where we work with the industrial base to get some feedback, and we're gonna definitely wanna pilot this at first. Uh, we're probably gonna pilot it at first with some of the smaller programs in the Army at the ACAT 2, ACAT 3 level, for example. Uh, and we're in the process right now of surveying the landscape to look at which programs have upcoming developmental mi milestones that will make themselves good candidates uh, for this type of an effort. Uh, we hope to have uh, some feedback pretty soon about which programs we'll use. We're working our way through that. Uh, but certainly in terms of ideas about how to make the project successful, uh, ultimately how we hope to scale it out, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Kim Bueller, who is here from our Small Business Programs Office, uh, and to, of course, to ASALT, who handles the acquisition process for all of our programs of record. And although he was originally going to be here, he couldn't be here, is uh, Doug Bush, our current ASALT. Uh, he is well aware of this. He is working in partnership with Kim uh, to make sure that we get this program off the ground. Now, your second question was about talent uh, and making sure that you know, that talent can be widely accessed throughout the uh, industrial base, both large and small. To be very clear, I, I don't think we encourage in the Army anybody to go look for jobs at AUSA, so I just want to be absolutely clear about that. Um, but, but I do think the issue of permeability of talent is really important. Uh, I'll tell you, although it's not directly related, I do believe that there is value in, and we have lots of training with industry programs. Uh, and I know in, in the last few years, the Department of Defense had opportunities uh, to have even talent exchanges where folks from the industrial base worked in uh, the Department of Defense in various offices, whether it was a contracting organization, a PEO, uh, or in some cases here at the headquarters, we'd like to find ways to expand those talent exchange programs because I think it really benefits everybody. Uh, I think the value to our small business innovation base is that it gives you better awareness of what opportunities exist, how to navigate the process, and it gives you that institutional know-how. So. Uh, I'd be very eager to work with the community to find better ways to refine our current programs or, if needed, to start some new ones. Uh, yeah, I've got a uh, quick question about the Army budgets. Um, uh, my name is Paul Melrose, and uh, I own CompoTech. We've uh, done majority of defense um, work with the Army, and uh, looking at the 22 budgets, it looked like the R&D and procurement budget was down, let's say, between 6 and 7 percent, whereas uh, Air Force and Navy were up 15 percent. Do you see a lot less overall dollars going out um, with Army versus other programs? Yeah, so you want me to comment on that first? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I get this question a lot right around budget rollout. Um, I'll say a couple of different things. There is, first of all, no expectation that all three of the services get one-third, one-third, one-third in the federal budget. Um, you know, we are basing our budget in FY23 and in future budgets based on our national defense strategy. Uh, there are uh, needs uh, for investment across the department that have been prioritized in recent years. I'll give you the biggest example, which is our nuclear triad recapitalization. Uh, that is largely a, an area of investment that the Army doesn't own. It is Air Force and it is Navy. Uh, and that accounts for a lot of what that disproportionate uh, investment looks like. Uh, and I think we're doing the right things as a Department of Defense, and we're doing it in order to make sure that as a, as a Department of Defense, we're ready to meet whatever challenges we have. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, unlike the other services, though, most of the Army's R&D budget, although some of it does, a lot of it does, not all of it goes disproportionately to a handful of huge developmental programs, like you'll see in the Navy build, building aircraft carriers or, or submarines or Air Force developing next generation fighters the Army spreads its investment a little bit uh, differently. And certainly it creates, in my view, a lot more opportunities for small business participation. So relatively speaking, I think if you're a small business, the Army is the best place to do business. Perfect, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, sir. My name is Adam Rentschler. I work for a company called Valid Evaluation. We've been a contractor to the XTech program since the beginning. So first a comment. Your remarks in these five initiatives prove to me, as a small business person, that the Army is listening. So thank you so much. These are brave experiments that you guys are running. It's not without risk to you and your team, and I deeply appreciate that. Uh, my question is this. 
What's being done right now at your level, perhaps even above, within the Department of the Army to make risk-taking okay for people that are running programs like XTEC? Um, what are we doing to protect the people that are taking those risks and running those experiments? What are we doing to make it okay to occasionally fail in pursuit of a more dynamic Army that is better, better equipped in the future? Well, two things. First of all, thanks for your comment. I really appreciate it. And the credit really goes to the team that has developed these initiatives. So I'm very grateful to the ingenuity that, that the Army leadership team has put together. Um, as to your point about risk taking, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, but I've served in, in acquisition in the Army before, in you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And it was a very different culture than it is today when I come back to this job uh, in 2022. Uh, and I would characterize that in a couple of different ways. You know, first, I think Congress led the way in 2016 by changing the culture with uh, authorities that were given to the Department of Defense uh, and the expectation that each of the services would utilize them. So I alluded to another question earlier, the fact that the Army has been the largest user of OTAs. We've made extensive use of those different acquisition pathways that have been made available to include those, you know, uh, mid-tier uh, uh, rapid pathways that we now currently have. I think some of that begins to change the culture. Uh, the Army has also responded institutionally, uh, whether it's creating the Rapid Capabilities Critical Technology Office, uh, it is the leadership within ASALT that I think is eager to move as quickly as it can uh, with programs that are now delegated down to the Army as opposed to managed up to OSD. All of these things cumulatively make a difference and I think they set a very different culture. So while I think there's always room for us to, for us to improve, I think we've made some significant strides uh, in encouraging people to fail fast, fail quickly, fail often, whatever the case may be. But we know that by starting, for example, prototyping efforts, uh, we're going to begin to get after uh, maturing the critical technologies that we're going to need. Uh, I think the uh, jury is still out, but I'm very pleased with the progress that we've been making so far. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Jeff McChesney. I'm CEO of a company called Target Arm. We've got a, a leading edge, bleeding edge actually, innovation capability that we, we've been trying to sell to the Army for a couple of years now. And uh, I keep running up against a wall of requirements versus something that doesn't exist today uh, in the Army's purview. Uh, along the way, the question is actually around SIBRs. So SIBRs with the reauthorization for three years in the language of the law states that open topics now must be in all the services. Can you uh, articulate uh, what the Army's view of that is and how you're going to actually execute that? Because it'll open up the door for me. Well, I mean, certainly, I think if there's ways that we can make the CIBR program a little bit more responsive to unplanned requirements, I'm always all ears and I'm very supportive of ways to do that. Uh, I'm encouraged and I'm hopeful that uh, everything gets reauthorized. I mean, certainly, we are, we are strongly in favor of that. Uh, I think the other part of it is we have a gap in our requirements process that we need to address. Uh, and I hear this all the time even from larger businesses. There are areas where they've invested IRAD in a capability that doesn't have a very clearly identified proponent on the requirement side. Uh, and it, we're starting to see this, for example, even in the area of logistics. So you heard Secretary Warmoth give a speech yesterday where she talked about pivoting uh, to meeting our responsibilities for the joint force in the area of contested logistics. We are going to relook, for example, in that space, all of our requirements, some of which have not been looked at for about 10 years to figure out how do we deal with, for example, um, fuel and water distribution and storage? How do we make sure that we're leveraging commercial innovation and tools to ensure that we can rapidly deploy and understand from a C2 perspective where our capabilities are anywhere in the battle space? Particularly as we're looking at Indo-PACOM where there's the tyranny of vast distances. All of these things, you, it works really well when you have a very clearly defined proponent and requirements organization that uh, develops that. I think where we have these gaps, we're gonna need to find ways to address it uh, as you know, the Army has been very innovative in this area. In some cases, we developed cross-functional teams to address capability gaps. In other areas, we're putting a lot of emphasis on relooking old requirements. So I think depending on what technologies you or other But, but are you going to look at anything that doesn't have a requirement? In other words, uh, you open up the functional area to say, we're looking for anything in autonomy, for example, which Absolutely. is where I am. Absolutely. Ver versus saying, this is exactly what we want uh, and us trying to meet that, which, we don't, you know, it's a square hole and a round peg. Yeah, no, and I think we have to have that flexibility because okay. as you're working in the S&T base, there isn't as much a defined requirement, and depending on where you are in the process, you know, there's a lot of flexibility in that space. But I think we can do better with some of these more mature applied technologies that maybe don't have an immediate uh, requirement that we're responding to today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Good morning, sir. Dan Gorber with DG Technologies and Outperform Management. Uh, as you're probably aware, many, if not most, small businesses live off of firm fixed price contracts with base plus awards. Uh, in May and September, uh, your office released a memorandum was talking about uh, managing the effects of inflation. Okay, and on firm fixed price contracts that have base plus, uh, we currently have an inflation rate that's out of control. Uh, what is your office doing, and what would your advice be to small businesses about how to manage uh, contracts that were awarded uh, with a, at an inflation rate which was two to three percent, and now we're dealing with nine to eleven? Okay, and you want us to retain and hire high quality talent. Uh, and keep them in those positions so we provide continuity of operations to the force. What is your advice to small businesses that are now stuck or locked into a 2 to 3% inflation rate where we're having to the challenge of a workforce that's demanding significantly higher? Thank well, you. First, yeah, no, thank you for your question. I think it's a timely one, and I think it's on the mind of many people that are here. I want to first say that we are very much concerned and very much thinking about the challenges that all of you similarly situated companies are currently facing, whether it's uh, challenges with a tight labor market, issues with uh, inflation, or certainly supply chain uh, concerns in which maybe your sources have changed markedly or dried up in the last couple of years as we've gone through a pandemic. All of these perturbations, I think, are impacting all of you in ways that uh, are, are very real. Uh, what I will say is I wish I had a single easy solution to say, go to this person and solve your, all your problems, uh, but we don't. I think depending on the challenge, I think we need to find ways to work with you to find solutions that will, are tailored to uh, your particular program, your particular effort. Uh, and we work that through the contracting process, as you know very, very well. Um, you know, what we have done in, in FY22, and I worked this personally across the Department of Defense, was to make sure that we could adequately assess where we, which programs are experiencing the most perturbations as a result of inflationary pressures. Uh, what I found and what I heard writ large was that these concerns were starting to show in 22, but we would really begin to see them in 23 and potentially into 24. So what I would encourage all of you to do is to work with your KO, make sure that those issues are well known, and I will personally, as Under Secretary of the Army and Chief Management Officer of the Army, making sure that we are looking at the problem systemically across our entire supplier base. Uh, as you know, it varies by commodity, it varies by geographic location, it varies by the type of program that you're working on. Uh, but it's all important to us because what we can't afford is to have systemic failures uh, across a group of our programs or in an area of investment. So uh, I'm committed to working with all of you to make sure that we do it better. And we will only do that if we hear from you what your specific concerns are. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Hi. Yes, ma'am. A um, little short here. Uh, Martha Dixon, large business. Um, you, I have a two-part question. Uh, you mentioned part of your five uh, initiatives. Number one was the Army Catalyst and uh, the funding being 10 times larger than CIBR, <laughs> which is great for that program. Um, but I'm wondering, what does that do to CIBR, right? Um, does it take uh, the possible um, small businesses that are would normally go to CIBR, now go to the Catalyst? Um, does it make CIBR obsolete? And have you thought about um, increasing or increasing the range of grants um, awarded to the CIBR program? Uh, so to the last part of your question, yes, we're going to relook at the range of grants that we're awarding as part of CIBR. And to be clear, uh, this Catalyst program is a portion of the CIBR effort. So okay. we're going to reserve, it's a withhold, if you will, of about 15% of the annual program to align it to those critical technologies that are needed for the Army in a way where we can make a little bit more targeted, more focused, and more sustained investment to help us get where we want to go. Uh, at the end of the day, we're in the business of ensuring that our warfighters have the very best capabilities we possibly can. We're in a technology race with our near peers and really, frankly, uh, all over the world. Uh, so we want to try this as an effort to see if we might be able to help some companies uh, you know, get over the hump in terms of developing uh, with our investment uh, some capabilities that we're going to need into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Hello. Uh, good morning. My name is Zhao Bing Feng. I'm uh, the, the global defense uh, lead at the Advocacy Center of uh, um, International Trade Administration in Commerce Department. And we help U.S. companies competing overseas for uh, public tenders, including defense, of course. 
<clears throat> so I just um, graduated from National Defense University, and uh, one of the programs there is about the procurement. Mm -hmm. So our office works very closely on procurement in other countries. One of the things that we see the pattern is that our competitors, let's say China, they uh, release a tender and then um, one of the competitor, um, uh, bidders won the tender and the other two maybe, you know, didn't get it. But the Chinese government award some kind of a reimbursement for their, the, the efforts, the time, the design they put in, and then, um, you know, maybe later, let's say the tech, um, architecture um, a bit. So later, they might use portion of that design for other purposes. So um, I was wondering for the Army, is there a possibility that we can do something similar um, to help smaller, especially small businesses, to um, compensate some of the, you know, if they don't make it to the, the bid, at least compensate some of the, the, the efforts that they put into it. I think that will inspire, encourage the small business to bid for these tenders. Because in that class, we heard that if the Army military has some technology and they release a bid, then only these bigger companies can afford to design and take that risk to lose. And then once they lose, they don't get anything out of that effort. That's just something that from uh, the Commerce yeah. Advocacy Center perspective to provide some input for small business that maybe help them. No, thanks Thank for your question. You. I, I appreciate it and uh, have been on in industry myself. So I understand what a barrier, you know, BNP, bid and proposal costs can be, uh, you know, to be able to effectively compete. You only have so many resources as a business owner and you've got to make sure you're placing the right bets uh, to get your company where they need to go. Um, you know, I, I think your, your suggestion is an intriguing one. I think we'd have to take a really close look about, you know, what defined portfolios might that make sense in where there's already areas where we are funding continued development, uh, maybe through other sources, whether it's through grants, uh, you know, other uh, cooperative research opportunities, or in some cases, you know, working with even the larger businesses. There are fully funded efforts to continue iterating on designs and prototypes, uh, you know, from multiple teams uh, that gives different teams at different stages of a program opportunities to continue funded work by the government. Uh, I'll give you an example. So. Uh, our tech demonstrator programs for, for example, future vertical lift or what we're doing now on our optionally manned fighting vehicle are trying to cast as wide a net as possible among teams uh, to continue to iterate on designs as much as possible. We want to keep that competition going. So I think we just have to look to see how we can best target something like that. Uh, something, something, you know, we, we can certainly explore. Uh, I think we just have to look to make sure that it's something that would be sustainable over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hello, Victor Sim from a startup company. Um, we are leveraging a new technology that's utilizing nano-based uh, um, yarn. And um, the questions I have are twofold. First is, um, we can address a lot of issues in the future. Some are low-hanging fruit, like the uh, uh, climate adaptive wearables, because um, our, our products can generate heat and generate electricity in remote areas, and it's lightweight. Um, and our, our, our technology is at like a level four for those, those product line. But we can address future product lines if we can get to kilowatts, then we can address um, um, drones and other aircraft and uh, vehicles. The challenge we have is when we talk to um, the Army, um, they 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 ask where you are on your technology tier, and on some product lines we're at level four, and some we are at level two. So if you or me, you or you're me sitting here, would you address the level two or the level four kind of space, and what's the likelihood of success if we go after the higher level tier, which is unique for us, but it's not change the world kind of technology? And then the second question is. 
for the raw materials, the current cost to generate 10 watts uh, or 50 watts is about 100K. Could we ask the Army to help get the raw materials so that we can bring the cost down and make it more of a commercial product? So that's my two questions. Yeah, no, those are, those are very good questions. They're very specific. Uh, so I think on the, yeah, B, BD Consulting on the podium. Um, so, so I think to your first question, you know, it, it's hard for me to say in the abstract, you know, which way you would go uh, in terms of, of where to invest your resources. I think that's a business decision you'd have to make. Uh, what I would tell you, though, is engage with a wide range of Army uh, uh, subject matter experts. Because I think, you know, for all of us, what's driving us is, is where do we have the most urgent capability needs? Something might be TRL-4 or TRL-8, uh, but if it's not as urgent to the NDS critical requirements the Army has or, or capabilities we know we're going to need in the next few years, even something that's TRL-3 or 4 might be more urgent. So it just depends. But I think the only way you're going to answer those questions is if you cast enough of a wide net to talk to the right proponents, people who own requirements, people who are doing acquisition in our program offices to get a sense of that. And then as far as kind of uh, you know, co-development to help make uh, pricing more competitive and commercial, uh, I think we'd love to do it across a whole range of areas. Uh, we are limited, of course, by the resources that we have uh, and the requirements that we have to prioritize. So depending on the technology, uh, you might find an open door, uh, just depending on what it is and who you talk to. Thank you. Last question, okay. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm Peggy Salmon with Gene Capture, and thank you for highlighting us. We are definitely um, the beneficiary of a lot of the extra work that goes into Mentor Protege. And I've, I wanted just to say that there's sort of some soft skills that come out of the Mentor Protege program because it's not just looking how can you be more effective on this contract or this product, but how can your business become more effective, which in the grand scheme of things is important. But here's my question for you. Um, you've got a lot of small businesses here today, and we've talked a lot about successes and hitting the benchmarks. What are your biggest frustrations about dealing with small business and meeting the needs that you have? Well, I wouldn't say it's a frustration. I think, I think I share frustration that they have, right? It's understanding how to navigate the process. Uh, I think, and this is true not just of acquisition or small businesses, I think a lot of what the Department of Defense does, it can be very stovepipe. So I think we, very quickly when we talk to people such as you in the audience, we want to point you to the program that we've had that we know off the tip of, you know, the tip of our tongue, we've been talking about you know, for the last 10, 15 years. I think what my frustration is, we need to continue to innovate. I mean, if we're gonna stay ahead of the curve, we've gotta try, and even if we fail, try different efforts, you know, try a different route. I, I was personally tired of the debate between, and it was always about valley of death. Do we get you know, more funding directly to small businesses and commercial solutions, and then how do we transition them? And I've answered this question a lot since I've come back to government. And I said, it's, it's a very limiting discussion because you're defining only two direct approaches. I think there is a blend, as all of us know, who have been in business, different ways to get your foot in the door, different ways to do business yeah. with uh, your customer set in the government. And so I think our uh, programs, our initiatives, and our efforts have to span that range as well. So uh, as long as I'm here in the job, I'm going to try to push. And, yeah. and some of these, hopefully, all of them will work. If some of them don't, we'll try different ones. And I think that's, that's what our responsibility is, is to continue to try to innovate uh, to find better ways to tap into the innovation that all yeah. of you provide. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the Secretary of the Army. Um, our next uh, speaker is a little delayed, so I'd encourage uh, a break in place. Or uh, Normally, I'd get you up and do calisthenics, but I can't do them anymore, so I won't ask you to do them. So we'll, we'll stand by for another five, 10 minutes till uh, Honorable Bush uh, arrives.